Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today as we continue our colloquium series for the, Bla for the Brown Planetarium here at Ball State University in Muncie, Indiana. My name is Greg Gallagher. I'm a graduate student here at Ball State University in the Department of Physics and Astronomy. And joining me, we have not only a classroom of very excited students and faculty, but also a very special guest here to talk to us about the exciting field of exoplanet science using the James Webb Space Telescope, Dr. Ian Wong. Dr. Wong was born and raised in Irvine, California, and received a BA in linguistics in 2012 from Princeton University after a semester-long internship in the Advanced Propulsion Laboratory at NASA MSFC. He entered the PhD program in planetary science at Caltech. As part of Professor Michael Brown's group, he embarked on a wide-ranging study of icy minor bodies in the middle and outer solar system, including photometric and spectroscopic characterization of Jupiter Trojans, Hildas, and small Kuiper Belt objects. In addition, he worked on atmospheric characterization of gas giant exoplanets with Professor Heather Knutson, with a focus on secondary eclipse and phase curve photometry from the Spitzer Space Telescope and transmission spectroscopy using data from the Hubble Space Telescope. After defending his PhD thesis in 2018, Ian moved across the country to Boston, where he began a, th a three-year stint at MIT as a 51 Pegasi B postdoctoral fellow under the supervision of Professor Richard Benzel. During his time at MIT, his research continued to straddle both solar system science and ex exoplanet astronomy. He has contributed to ground and space-based characterization of Jupiter Trojans in support of the recently launched Lucy mission and carried out photometric studies of active centaurs. Using photometry from the Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite, or TESS, he has embarked on a systematic multi-year study of visible light exoplanet phase curves while simultaneously pursuing discoveries of new exoplanets. As an NPP fellow at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center in Dr. Stephanie Millen's group, Ian will leverage the unique capabilities of the James Webb Space Telescope to carry out exciting science, including intensive spectroscopic analyses of comets and Jupiter Trojans, as well as exoplanet atmospheric studies. Outside of research, he enjoys playing violin, exploring the outdoors, and streaming video games. And that is quite a list of accomplishments, Dr. Wong. We're very appreciative of your time, and we're looking forward to your presentation. So with that, I'll go ahead and just turn it over to you. All right. All right. Um, is everything looking good here? All right. Um, so thanks for the introduction, Greg. Um, so I heard from Greg that uh, there's a lot of interest in exoplanets in this group, and um, I figured that uh, instead of just focusing on JWST, I was going to give a sort of a broad overview of exoplanet science, all the way from discovering them to the last few decades of, of, of characterization uh, of their atmospheres um, and through to the near future with the upcoming JWST launch. So um, unlike the classical planets in our own solar system, um, by and large, exoplanets are just too far and too faint to be resolved by even moderate instruments. So most of the methods for detection are indirect um, and instead rely on detecting changes to the star's properties. So in the top here, we see two methods that are particularly productive in discovering exoplanets. Um, transit photometry uh, measures the deficit in light when the planet passes in front of the star. Uh, and radial velocities uh, leverage the gravitational pull that the planet exerts on the star, which in turn red shifts and blue shifts the spectrum uh, periodically. Um, there are some other more exotic methods of detecting exoplanets. For example, we have microlensing, uh, in which the uh, chance alignment of a foreground star with the planet uh, acts as a gravitational lens to a background star, and the blip uh, gives you the hint of a exoplanet uh, being uh, bound to the foreground star. More recently, with the launch of the Gaia mission, um, we've been able to leverage extremely precise astrometric measurements of star positions on the sky to essentially carry out the same type of analysis as radial velocities, but in the plane of the sky. So you're seeing the star move in the sky due to the reflex motion 
uh, from the planet's gravitational pull. Uh, and also recently, there are indeed some very, very special systems for which we can actually directly detect uh, the exoplanet's light, uh, but these are very rare and very special. So let's go over the transit method in, uh, in some more detail. So here the animation shows what the transit light curve looks like. Um, these are very amenable to discovery because the transit signal is very deep uh, on the order of maybe a percent of the, of the star's light. And by looking at those little dips, we can very accurately measure the orbital period. The amount of light that is lost during the transit is directly proportional to the square of the relative planetary radius, uh, which gives you the size of the, of the planet. Um, taking it to even higher level detail by modeling the duration of the transit and the shape of the light curve, we can back out information about the inclination of the orbit, uh, the semi-major axis through Kepler's law, uh, as well as eccentricity of the orbit. And this sort of gives you beginnings of a three-dimensional picture of the, of the uh, orbital architecture. So uh, a very um, complementary technique, which is the rate of velocity method, uh, as I mentioned before, measures the periodic red and blue shifting of the star spectrum due to the gravitational pull of the planet on the star. Um, likewise, uh, we can also get the orbital period for measuring this sinusoidal signal. The signal shape of the RV curve also gives you um, uh, concomitant constraints on the orbital eccentricity. Now, what's important about the RV method is that it gives you an estimate of the planet's mass, uh, of course, uh, convolved with the orbital inclination. So a particularly powerful way of characterizing exoplanets is to combine the transit and the RV method so you can get both the radius and the mass. And that really gives you a complete picture, of, uh, at least a first order picture of what the planet is like. So on the right here, we see the actual discovery uh, RV curve of 51 Picus IB, which is the first exoplanet discovered around a sun-like star. Uh, this was recently awarded the Nobel uh, Prize in Physics. Uh, I believe it was last year. All right, so um, RV surveys have been carried out for many decades from the ground, but what has really opened the floodgates to exoplanet discoveries are space-based transit searches, uh, starting with a European-led Corot mission in 2007, and then continuing through the Kepler and K2 missions uh, in the last decade, and now uh, continuing on with the ongoing test mission. Uh, these uh, spacecrafts have unleashed thousands of new candidates, of which over 4,000 have been confirmed. Here in the bottom, we see the star sky coverage areas of these uh, missions. So the top uh, yellow cross is the Kepler field. Uh, in 2013, it suffered a momentum wheel failure, uh, which uh, uh, made it transition to the K2 mission, which follows the ecliptic plane. Uh, and you see all those uh, individual uh, yellow crosses for the K2 mission. Uh, TESS is unique in that it covers the full sky. So uh, in its two-year mission, it's covered almost the entire sky already. And in the extended mission that's going on now, it will fill in the gaps along the ecliptic. So here's a plot of the cumulative number of exoplanets discovered um, as a function of year. You see that in the 90s, um, there were you know, so just a small trickle. Um, and then the radio velocity method started kicking in with systematic searches. But it's really in 2009, 2010, where the floodgates open, as I mentioned before, with Kepler. Uh, and um, to date, uh, the overwhelming majority of, of discovered exoplanets are thanks to the Kepler and test missions. Now, what transiting systems give us is, is uh, a window into the atmosphere, which is really the focus of this talk. And the focus of a lot of the interest in exoplanets is trying to characterize their atmospheres in more detail. And um, really, transiting systems are the best candidates for these types of intensive studies. Right, so just a really quick picture of our understanding of exoplanet demographics. Um, you see in red the, uh, you know, seven of the solar system planets. Um, and we see sort of some over densities here. So this uh, the the um, the blob at the upper left uh, is unique because it is something very different than uh, from what we see in the solar system. These are what we call hot gas giants or hot Jupiters. They're massive planets that are very close to their star and very hot. Uh, and these are among the best candidates for atmospheric characterization due to their size and in, in, in temperature. 
To the right here, the, a lot of the black points discovered by radial velocity are what we call more classical gas giants. They're more akin to what we find like you know, in Jupiter, Saturn, uh, in our own solar system. Um, and those are um, often not very good targets for atmospheric characterization because they're colder and most of them do not transit. Now, uh, in the lower left, uh, we have a kind of a mixed bag. We have some warm ice giants. Um, I guess you wouldn't call them ice giants. We call them Neptunes or sub-Neptunes. They're um, ice giant sized planets, but that are very close to their host stars. And this is, again, a category of planet that we do not see at all in our own solar system. And below that, at the very, very bottom left corner is what we are trying to chip at with tests. Uh, these are the terrestrial planets, you know, rocky planets that are a lot like Earth, uh, but are somewhat closer to their host star. So they're kind of hot terrestrial planets or super Earths as we like to call them. And so this is sort of the exoplanet menagerie as we see it now. Uh, and a lot of this is thanks to both RV surveys and Kepler and TESS. Uh, and the results of these surveys has been kind of the holy grail of, of uh, exoplanet demographics. And this is the planet frequency plot. So here in the, uh, the plotted here, we have the, um, the unbiased um, absolute uh, frequency of, of short period plan planets. So these are planets on orbital periods less than 100 days. And some of the big takeaways are that gas giants are very rare. Um, they're very rare uh, in, in a broad sense, but they are sort of disproportionately favored for atmospheric studies, as you will see in the following slides. Uh, one of the very peculiar discoveries in the last few years is this sort of bimodal distribution uh, below three Earth radii. And this is sort of a valley that, dis that divides super Earths, which are rocky, uh, high density objects, and sub Neptunes, which are small, uh, but nonetheless gaseous, you know, uh, giant planets. Um, and this is something that a lot of people have been working on and trying to understand what this means for solar system formation. Um, and uh, this, these, it is these planets that are sort of the next step in our uh, quest to understand exoplanet uh, atmospheres. So just other, some other fun sort of Snapple facts. Um, on average, we think that there's about one planet per every star in the Milky Way uh, of, of, of various sizes. Uh, so that's just, you know, a lot of, a lot of planets, a lot of planets nearby. Um, planets such as ubiquitous, a natural formation of, of star formation is, is planets. Um, particularly interesting for a lot of people is, is habitable planets, potentially habitable planets. Um, and the estimates differ a lot more. It really depends on what you consider the habitable zone and a lot of the debiasing methods, but anywhere from a few tenths to about two Earth-sized planets within the habitable zone uh, around each sun-like star in the nearby uh, galaxy, galactic region. So that's also a, a lot of Earth-like planets um, out there. Um, so people who are interested in aliens, of course, they'd really like to jump on that. Um, but yeah, so that's sort of the current picture we have uh, thanks to the Kepler and test missions of what sort of the population studies of, of exoplanets is. All right, so um, the focus of this talk is talking about atmospheres, exoplanet atmospheres. So beyond mass and radius, atmospheres is sort of where we get to know each exoplanet in more detail. And atmospheres are highly complex uh, things. Uh, you see this diagram, there's all sorts of processes at play. There's the temperature pressure profile, uh, basically whether or not there's a stratosphere, or how does the temperature evolve with height in the atmosphere. Uh, in the upper levels, you have interactions with the stellar wind uh, and possible escaping gas. Uh, and other, other aspects that are very important are clouds and hazes. Um, they sort of affect the temperature and the chemistry in a big way that is still not fully understood. Uh, and to address and study these problems, uh, astronomers leverage a full arsenal of, of telescopes from the UV to the thermal infrared. And each of those wavelength bands probe a different height within the atmosphere. And different methods also can give you different windows into what is going on in, in the atmosphere. So it's really a synthesis of multiple different techniques, multiple different telescopes that we can actually really develop a, a narrative for each planet. Um, and we found that each one is unique in its own way. Uh, and the big picture now is to try to go forward and tie this into a bigger, bigger narrative about planet formation in general. So 
what are the main techniques we use to study atmospheres? So um, there's sort of three big configurations. The first one, and probably the favorite uh, among uh, the recent uh, studies is transmission. So this is when the planet passes in front of the star during transit and the starlight is filtered through the upper layers of the atmosphere, the sort of the, 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 the very low density upper layers of the atmosphere. Uh, and this can probe the composition in the high altitude regions, uh, the presence of clouds and hazes, as well as more exotic uh, processes like atmospheric escape and a vertical mixing. Uh, the second type of, of data set is uh, emission. So instead of the transmitted starlight, you're looking at the direct thermal emission from the planet's uh, surface. Um, this is most commonly done during secondary eclipse, which is when the planet passes behind the star, and you see the day side hemisphere disappear uh, behind the star's brightness. Uh, and lastly, is probably the most time consuming, but potentially the most uh, fruitful, uh, is called phase curves. And this is the whole, the whole shebang. You're tracking the brightness of the planet throughout its entire orbit. And because most of these planets are tidally locked to their stars, especially the hot ones, uh, you're uh, just like you see the different phases of the moon, um, you're looking at the full longitudinal range of the of the planet uh, across its orbit. And this allows you to study these global big picture processes like atmospheric dynamics, heat transport uh, across the entire surface. So I'm going to go through um, each of these uh, kind of briefly to save time, but uh, um, try to give you a picture of what has been done in the last few decades uh, in each of these um, respects. So transmission spectroscopy in more detail uh, is um, we're essentially trying to find the fingerprints of molecules in the upper atmosphere. So you have sort of a basal stellar spectrum that is emitted from the star. And this spectrum is passed through the upper layers of the atmosphere. And any molecules in its path will apply its unique spectral fingerprint on the uh, transmitted light. So whenever the absorption cross-section is large, um, more light will be blocked and the planet will effectively look bigger. You're essentially putting like a blanket around it, a hazy blanket around it at those wavelengths. Likewise, clouds can um, effectively wholesale block uh, a lot of the light going through, and that affects the shape of the spectrum that you measure. So by looking for these diagnostic spectral features, we can then back out the presence and abundance of various uh, important molecular species like water vapor, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, methane, uh, and uh, things like that. So as I mentioned before, each species has this kind of a fingerprint. Um, and you see here the uh, opacity of some of the big players in transmission spectroscopy. You have water vapor, you have methane, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, and they each have their kind of forest of absorptions that are then imprinted onto the transmitted light and detected by Earth-based or space-based telescopes. So by measuring and detecting these features, we get at some fundamental properties of the atmosphere, like the metallicity, you know, how, what is the ratio of heavy elements versus hydrogen, um, the elemental ratios like between carbon and oxygen, and these are important markers for, you know, bigger photochemical and, and atmospheric chemistry processes. And also this is dependent on temperature um, at the various altitude levels. So by, by looking at this, you can get a snapshot of what the temperature is like along uh, the edge of the planet. So uh, over the last decade, uh, the Hubble telescope has been particularly uh, uh, productive in helping us understand atmospheres of exoplanets in transmission. Um, particularly, you see uh, both the visible and the near infrared range is, is covered by the various instruments on, on the Hubble, Hubble Space Telescope. So on the left here, you just have a sort of a collection of transmission spectra for Exoplanets, these are all gas giants of various temperatures, you know, from anywhere from about 1,000 Kelvin to 2,500 Kelvin. Um, and you find uh, something very peculiar. You, um, you have this uh, very prominent, uh, uh, oops, you have a very prominent uh, water band at about 1.5 microns. Uh, and you find that this is detected in a lot of transmission spectra. And this suggests that water vapor is a, a big player, very ubiquitous in, in uh, gas giant atmospheres. Um, now for the other species, you really have to go farther down into the near infrared. So really past two microns, you start to see some of the 
uh, CO and CO2 features. Unfortunately, there are no spectroscopic instruments in space that have coverage in that region. So instead, mostly we rely on this, well, we used to rely on the Spitzer Space Telescope, which has broadband coverage at 3.6 and 4.5 microns. And those perfectly align with the methane and uh, CO features uh, out in the near infrared. So here you see a, a one of the, something I actually worked on recently. Uh, this is WASP-80, another sort of Jupiter mass planet. And you see this, uh, this feature at 4.5 microns that suggests um, the presence of CO2 and CO in the spectrum. But of course, uh, these are unresolved measurements. So we don't actually resolve the detailed shape of the absorption. We just compare the brightnesses or the transit depths at those two wavelengths and we infer the presence or absence of, of CO and methane. Um, so, so far, most of the studies have been really focused on large planets because they have large radii, the transit depths are large, and uh, they're hot, which helps uh, in, in, in the magnitude of the transmission features that we expect. But people have now started to look for very ideal smaller planets to leverage um, um, the transmission method. And so here you see a very recent example, and this is actually a, 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 a sub-Neptune, um, sorry, actually a super-Earth, uh, GJ1132b. Um, this is uh, the Hubble transmission spectrum between 1.1 and 1.7 microns. Uh, what's notable here is you don't see water anymore, but you actually see, see methane and this HCN feature, which is uh, one of the very first robust detections of this molecule in an exoplanet atmosphere. But by and large, at the current stage of, of our telescope facilities, uh, these smaller planets are just out of range. The features are too small, and we don't have the signal to noise uh, among uh, uh, with Hubble to, to retrieve the detailed uh, transmission spectrum. So, so molecular absorption is one thing, but another very common morphology of transmission spectra is this flat line here. So here is a, this is a Neptune sized planet, GJ436b. Now the red curve here is what you would expect if it you know, was a clear atmosphere. You would expect this very large water feature, but instead we see this totally flat spectrum. The reason for this is that there is a cloud deck. There's a cloud deck that's obscuring a lot of the transmitted light. And this can be a nuisance for people interested in trying to retrieve molecular abundances. But clouds and hazes themselves are interesting, you know, features in and, in and of them themselves. Um, on the right, you see there's a huge diversity of different types of clouds, you know, very exotic clouds that you would never even think about on Earth. You have silicate clouds, you know, basically vaporized rock. You have uh, atomic metals that are condensing also, uh, as well as some sulfate clouds. So these are just high temperature condensates that are uh, expected to be prevalent uh, in this temperature range shown here between 1,000 and 2,000 Kelvin. And uh, the clouds interact with the chemistry and temperature profile at the local level. Um, so their distribution and their heights within the atmosphere also reflect sort of more big picture aspects of the atmospheric properties like the temperature distribution and uh, vertical mixing. Yeah, so these interactions are only now being fleshed out in detail, and a lot of work has been uh, paid on the theoretical side to understanding their prevalence and, and their uh, behavior. All right, I'm going, to, I'm going to skip this for time's sake and just go to emission spectroscopy. Um, so emission spectroscopy measures the outgoing um, flux from the planet's surface. Um, here in this diagram, I don't know if you can see it clearly, but um, you have basically a cartoon showing the rotational bands of the, uh, methane and, and water. Um, and this is convolved with a temperature and pressure profile. So um, at different heights, the, the, the atmosphere is at a different temperature. And the emission spectrum is sort of an integral of all of that uh, black body radiation being filtered through the, the atmosphere. Um, and uh, leaving the surface. So the understanding the emission spectrum requires knowledge of the temperature pressure profile, as well as the molecular uh, composition. Um, and this is important for as, because this gives not just a view of the limb, which is what you see during transmission, but you see the entire hemisphere at once. 
So on the right here, we have uh, data from Hubble again. Uh, this is of the hot Jupiter WASP-43. Uh, uh, first, at the bottom here, we have what we saw before, the transmission spectrum. And you see this sort of little bump here uh, where the planet appears larger due to water vapor absorption. Um, and this feature becomes an absorption, usually, in emission, uh, because you're measuring the outgoing light. The water vapor blocks uh, this to some extent due to its opacity, and you get a sort of a dearth. In, in, in flux. So again, uh, a lot of this has been really carried by Spitzer. Spitzer has been to the workhorse with emissions spectroscopy. And the reason for this is because emissions spectroscopy is very difficult and visible and uh, basically wavelengths less than two micron. Uh, the contrast ratio between a planet and a star is just too small. Um, um, I'll remind you that the, in the transit, which is used for transmission spectroscopy, you're looking at the star's light being blocked. Whereas for emission, you're measuring the planet's light itself. And that's just a much, much more um, uh, difficult endeavor. And um, at, at more red wavelengths, farther into the thermal infrared, uh, the contract ratio of the planet increases uh, monotonically and you get more signal to noise there. So that's where Spitzer has really stepped up um, to help us understand the emission spectra. But again, this is broadband data. So you're looking at basically integrating the flux across a wide range of wavelengths, and you lose a lot of the detail there. But nonetheless, we've been able to learn a lot about um, emission spectra to first order. And one of the important things that we found uh, is that we find evidence of isothermal uh, temperature pressure profiles. That means a, a, a an atmosphere that is roughly the same temperature throughout, uh, at least throughout the regions that we're probing. But you also find both non-inverted and inverted temperature profile. So a non-inverted temperature profile is like, like the blue curve here. Uh, it's monotonically decreasing with increasing height, whereas the inversion shows this sort of kink here, uh, indicative of a stratosphere, where you have an inverted layer. Um, and this is important for driving a lot of the atmospheric chemistry. And on the right here, we have uh, Hubble emission spectra. You know, the data looks very ratty, and that's just how it goes, uh, very challenging to, to look at this wavelength range and emission. But you see, you know, where you have this absorption, this means you have a non-inverted, monotonically decreasing temperature profile. Uh, but when you have a positive bump, um, you're preferentially blocking the lower layers, which happen to be colder. So within the water band, you get excess flux from the hotter upper atmosphere. And so those are uh, there's a telltale sign of inverted atmospheres. And of course, you have plenty of data sets that are consistent with a straight line, which indicates uh, an isothermal uh, continuum uh, thermal emission. Right. So last on the list of methods is phase curves. Uh, very briefly, uh, again, phase curves, you're looking at different phases of the planet. So during transit, the planet's night side is facing the observer, the maximum darkness. Uh, and this gradually progresses to the day side hemisphere during secondary eclipse, when the day side is facing the observer. And by tracking the variation in the brightness, we're able to back out the brightness distribution as a function of longitude. So once again, uh, it's sort of a theme here. Um, these types of observations are most efficiently done in the infrared, the thermal infrared. And this is where Spitzer is king. Uh, and here you see in the double, uh, upper left, you have the phase curve of the classic hop Jupiter um, HD 189733b. And what's a, a common feature you see here is that an offset between the time of maximum brightness and the time of secondary eclipse. So naively, you would think that the star's light would be instantly reflected or re-radiated from the substellar point. So the, the point immediately below where the star is above the planet's atmosphere. But in practice, we find this sort of offset hotspot here. So you see the little diagram on the right here. It shows the brightness distribution or the temperature distribution uh, of this planet, uh, you find that the hot, hottest point is offset to the east relative to the, the substellar point. And this is indicative of winds. You have equatorial winds that are driving circulation from the day to the night side of this uh, tidally locked planet. Uh, and not only is it uh, equatorial but in eastward, but it's super rotating. It's rotating faster than the planet is. It's transporting heat away from the substellar point and moving it off to the east. 
And this is um, a very common feature uh, uh, you see across most of these specific phase curves. Uh, and this is also borne out in very detailed numerical modeling. So in the bottom left here, you see an output of a GCM, a general circulation model that predicts this offset to the east uh, thanks to these strong equatorial winds. All right, so Spitzer, as I said, is the workhorse with phase curves so far, uh, but there have been some attempts at doing spectroscopic phase curves with Hubble. And this is sort of a preview of what you're gonna do with JWST. Uh, and of course, it's very difficult at the wavelength range uh, between one and two microns, but nonetheless, there has been su some success in retrieving phase resolved uh, emission spectra of a few hot Jupiters, such as the WASP-43b. And you can see um, the data for four, the four quarters. You have the night side, which is the lowest, uh, very cold. Uh, the day side in green is the hottest, where you see this water absorption coming in. And you have the two intermediate quadratures, um, the first and third quarters, which are in between. And from that, you can use you know, fancy atmospheric retrievals and foreign models um, to predict what the temperature structure is. So on the right here is what we uh, what they retrieved from this data um, as far as the temperature pressure profile is concerned. And you, sh and you can see that you know, it goes from hot in the green to the coldest in the beige, um, but all of them are monotonically decreasing. So these are non-inverted temperature prof pressure profiles. That's just a taste of what you can do with uh, phase resolved uh, spectroscopic phase curves. All right, so uh, at this juncture, we can kind of look back at what we've found out over the last few decades and look forward and ask ourselves some of the big questions. So um, the big question, uh, especially going specifically focusing on atmospheres is how much more detailed can we look at atmospheres? And we sort of have some first order pictures. We have detections of water, we have detections of methane and carbon dioxide, but abundances are really hard to come by, especially really precise ones. And how, how well can we know an exoplanet? And this is sort of the, what JWST is gonna help us answer. Um, looking at the big picture in an ensemble sense, uh, great, we have a bunch of these individually characterized exoplanets. How do they fit into the bigger picture? So how do the atmospheres vary uh, as a function of, let's say, mass or the stellar host type or the temperature. Uh, these are the questions that require a lot more systems, you need more systems at higher detail before we can answer this question. Uh, now we're getting, now getting into an even bigger picture uh, questions now, uh, the, the sort of fundamental questions, how do they form? How do they evolve? And specifically, how can we use atmospheric observations to get at the past history of exoplanets? Um, can we use what we measure today to infer the past history of a given planet? Um, and then the last question here, uh, which is sort of the sort of untrodden ground is these smaller planets, you know, super, super Earth and sub-Neptunes, they're largely untouched due to their difficulty with the current instrumentation. Um, with these new instruments like JWST, how can we explore them and what will we find there? Um, and that's something that we will give the answer to in the next decade. All right, so uh, I'll skip really quickly to, to JWST. Um, so JWST will be launching next month and it's really an engineering feat. Um, it has a 6.5 meter diameter um, aperture, uh, which is folded into itself during launch. So it, this thing is uh, stored in a very compact configuration and it will unfurl when it gets to its uh, parking position. So here on the upper right, you see different views of the telescope. Uh, on top, you have, of course, the, the primary and secondary mirrors. Uh, what, what's interesting is because this is an infrared instrument, the instruments need to be kept below 50 Kelvin, very cold. So um, there's a very elaborately designed sun shield that is constantly facing the sun and making sure that the instruments are not exposed to direct uh, solar irradiation. Uh, on the back side, you have the communication suite, you have a solar array that gets the power, and of course the antenna that uh, the beams the signals back to Earth. Um, Webb is also very unique in that it's, placed in a, it's going to be placed in a very interesting place. Uh, so this is what we call the L2 Lagrangian point. It's just one of the stationary points in the sun-Earth uh, telescope three-body system. Uh, this is very, very far from Earth. So it, it's many times the distance uh, between Earth and the moon. Um, 
But because of the stationary nature of this gravitational potential there, Webb is basically stable there forever. You know, it, it will sort of librate around the stationary point uh, and constantly be looking in the opposite direction of the sun. And this is very useful because Hubble was a geo geocentric uh, uh, facility, which meant that the Earth would block its view of most of the sky every every 40 minutes or so, which made the duty cycle very low. Essentially, half the time you're off the sky because the Earth is in the way. Uh, Webb's, you know, the position of Webb sort of foregoes this obstacle and is able to observe 24-7, 365 uh, with no interruptions. That really helps widen and broaden the volume of science that you can do with the instrument. Um, and this again is a, is, a, is a comparison with Hubble, the predecessor. Um, it has you know, almost three times larger um, mirror diameter. Uh, and crucially, it is exclusively focused on the near infrared region. So this is the infrared, near infrared and thermal infrared facility. Uh, basically, it cuts. It starts out in the red, about 0 0.7, 0 0.8 microns, and extends all the way down to around 30 micrometers. Um, the wider aperture gives us better sensitivity, and the wavelength coverage really unlocks parts of the wavelength spectrum that we have never accessed before from the ground or in the space. So there's a lot of sort of virgin territory here that we will be um, opening up to ourselves for the very first time, uh, particularly between two and five microns. Okay, so here is a um, overview of the instrument suite. So there is a quartet of instruments. Um, you have NERCAM, which is primarily an imaging uh, instrument that covers between about 0.7 and 5 microns. Uh, it does also have a, a high resolution spectroscopy mode, um, but it's primarily going to be used uh, with both broad and airborne filters to do imaging. Uh, what's notable is that it has a coronagraph. So a coronagraph basically is a mask that can be placed in the field to block uh, star's light. And this will come become very important when we're looking at directly imaged planets. You want to block the star's light to see the planet's mission. Uh, you need a coronagraph to do that. And JWST has one uh, on board that will be used uh, to, to study those types of objects. Next up, we have the spectroscopic uh, counterpoint counterpart, a NERS spec, which covers roughly the same wavelength range. It has many different modes from low to high resolution. Uh, the highest resolution gives an R of over 3000. Uh, it, uh, in, it's a market improvement over Hubble. Next up, we have NERIS, uh, which combines uh, near infrared imaging at high cadence with slitless uh, high pass through spectrograph. So it kind of does both. It does a lot of imaging uh, for use uh, in, in, um, in, in infrared imaging, uh, but also it can be used for a very high frequency time series observations, for example, of, of transits, of exoplanet transits. You can sample it uh, very, very quickly uh, with a very high pass-through of flux. And last up is um, MIRI, which is the mid-infrared instrument. And that extends from about five microns all the way down to 30 microns. Uh, and it has uh, both imaging in broadband filters uh, with coronagraph cap capabilities uh, and also low and medium resolution uh, spectroscopy. So together, this is a very veritable arsenal of instruments that can be used to study all aspects of atmospheric uh, exoplanet atmospheres. All right, so let's, um, in the time remaining, I want to go through some of the exciting um, science that can be unleashed with JWST. So first and foremost, gas giants will still be king. So the focus will still largely be on these gas giants because they give you the most signal and allow us to do the most detailed science. And so here in the top left, you have a prediction of um, the transmission spectrum, the near infrared transmission spectrum of WAS-52. This is a very inflated Jupiter, flat Jupiter. And you can see the, the exquisite precision throughout the entire um, wavelength range. And note, there's a lot of um, overlap here. Um, the instruments, filters, the grisms uh, dovetail each other. So we get you know, high precision, high resolution throughout this entire wavelength range, and you can we are expecting to resolve very, very fine details, including ammonia, uh, methane, CO, CO2, and, and also some of the uh, iron silicate features that have never really been probed before with Hubble. 
And from such a detailed picture, we, we are able to get precise individual elemental abundances, which is very important when we want to put these planets in the bigger picture of solar system uh, of planetary formation. So things like C to O, uh, O to H uh, can give us flags for where the atmosphere was accreted. So if, if the planet accreted in the region of the solar planetary disk where, for example, water is condensed out, you would have a different uh, O to H ratio than if it formed closer in where water is in its gas phase. Uh, so bottom is in the uh, in the bottom. Oops, sorry. Uh, at the bottom, we have another example, another hot Jupiter here, was seventy nine B. Uh, you just see again, you're not only retrieving the one point four micron uh, water feature, but all the other rotational bands. Um, and just for comparison, you see these uh, vertical black bars. That is the equivalent precision of Hubble at the wavelength range around one point four microns. And you can just see the market improvement uh, that JWST will bring. And here in the bottom right, we, we see uh, an atmospheric retrieval of the JWST mock spectrum and uh, the equivalent HST spectrum that we have. And in red, you see what the posteriors are, the, basically the, the parameter range that the, that the spectrum is consistent with. And you know, Hubble being less precise, you basically have a huge range of possible C to O ratios, a huge range of metallicities. Now, Come, come JWST, you'll be able to just absolutely pinpoint that very small region of parameter space where the, um, where the planet's atmosphere actually lies. And this huge increase in precision will enable us to say a lot more about the detailed chemistry uh, of the atmospheres. Uh, in admission, what's very interesting thing about clouds is that if you look into the far infrared, clouds uh, become not fully opaque. Um, they actually do let some light through and they do so in a very diagnostic way. They can actually um, pinpoint, allow you to pinpoint the species, the con condensate species that is at play. And this is something that has never been done uh, before. Uh, and this means that clouds will no longer be a nuisance. The clouds will be in and of, in of themselves an interesting feature that can be probed in, a, in the, the far infrared. And this is um, what will be done with Miri. So here, um, very quickly, it's a very busy plot, I'm sorry, but um, uh, I would like you to turn your attention to the, uh, the solid red line here. The solid red line is what you would expect if you had um, manganese, uh, this magnesium silicate cloud. Uh, and this absorption feature at 10 microns is due to the silicate. Uh, and um, if you were to measure that, you would be able to uh, say with certainty that you're looking at this particular cloud species and not, for example, the other one, uh, manganese sulfide. And this is just, uh, uh, so this is again an emission. Uh, and you can just see how much better the signal strength is at the, uh, at the long wavelengths. And MIRI will really allow us to uh, measure the emission spectra of cooler planets, uh, which are completely out of the range of HST. Uh, and this will open up a whole new region of parameter space that we can explore in the mission. And lastly, with phase curves, um, this is really, again, the holy grail of, of exoplanet uh, atmospheric characterization, getting a spectrum, an emission spectrum at every single phase. Uh, these are simulated uh, spect uh, emission spectra um, from a full orbit of WASP-43b, and this is a, a character we saw before. Uh, it, there have been attempts to do, there has been a published uh, Hubble um, phase curve uh, of this of this planet, but with J2ST, you'll be able to get really fine precision of the various molecular bands, as well as the precision on the the temperature pressure profile at each of these phases. So the the brightest phase is here at 0.5. This is at eclipse, where the temperature is the highest, uh, all the way down to the night side. Um, even though the temperature is very cold, something like 600 Kelvin or uh, 1000 Kelvin, we still can get a lot of information about what the temperature pressure profile looks like. And because we have this in spectral resolution, not just broadband, this is, these are spectra, we can also look at the molecular absorptions and see how they evolve across the surface. So again, this is sort of a busy plot, but um, each of these panels on the right is a different a major atmospheric species. You have water, you have CO, CO2, and methane. 
And you can see how the methane, which is um, dissociated at high temperatures, uh, is not present at all in, during the day side, but then forms, is expected to, to form um, and become a major contributor to the opacity on the night side, which is cooler. And the opposite is true with, with, with CO and CO2. There's an interplay, a well-known interplay between CO, CO2 and methane, and they kind of go in contrary motion across the planet's surface. And this is the type of really detailed mapping, you're really looking at compositional mapping now of exoplanet uh, atmospheres, which is something that's uh, totally new um, for us. Um, and moving on to the last slide, uh, to small planets, uh, there's a very, very well-known system now, uh, TRAPPIST-1, it's, it's sort of a solar system twin. There's seven known planets already, uh, but they're orbiting a very cool star. So the, the farthest planet is actually to scale uh, inside the orbit of Mercury, if you were to line up the, the two systems. Uh, but because the, the star is so faint, uh, the habitable zone encompasses this sort of inner region in green, and uh, TRAPPIST-1e is, is a very Earth-like, super-Earth planet. And you can see how the simulated spectrum from JWST, even though it's a lot less precise than the hot Jupiter ones, nonetheless, we'll be able to, to retrieve carbon dioxide, water, um, with um, you know, a few dozen visits, a few dozen transits together, we should be able to look at um, retrieving some molecules on these uh, small planets, which is very exciting and never been done before. So with that, um, I will end and open up for questions. Um, and the spacecraft will be launching on December 18th, early in the morning from the French Guiana. Um, and the next year and two will be, you know, a flurry of activity, both with commissioning, which I'm going to be involved with at Goddard, and also some of the early science guaranteed time observations, which I'm also going to be working on. Um, but there's just going to be a lot of excitement about um, exoplanets and other fields of astronomy as well, of course. Um, so um, keep your eyes peeled for, for the latest from JWST. So thanks. Wow. Thank you, Dr. Wong. That was highly informative and an amazing presentation. We really appreciate it. Um, I will go ahead and turn it over to the classroom first to see if um, any of the students or faculty there have questions. I know I've got a couple of my own, but but I want to see um, if uh, we have any from the classroom first. And we might need Dr. Vaccaro there to help facilitate that. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. Um, I'm behind the screen, so you're looking at the classroom. Uh, do any of the students have any questions? Don't see any hands just yet. Um, I have kind of a quick one. Um, I don't know if you can tell us or, or not. Uh, as far as exoplanets go, I have a particular interest in uh, Fomalot. Uh, are you or do you know of that being maybe a primary target? It's been in the news the past few years as the planet there, now formerly known as Dagon, by the way, um, <laughs> is uh, uh, missing. And so there was some questions as to whether or not it was ever a planet or it was destroyed or it just shrouded in something and needs, you know, JWST to see it. Yeah, this is a great question. Um, if, if you don't mind, uh, I have actually a backup slide uh, with an image uh, of, of, of that uh, system. Um, so, um, yeah, so here uh, in the bottom left, you actually see what JWST, this is actually Foma Hot B here. Um, well, formal hot, the disk. Uh, so you have the Spitzer image in the thermal infrared, you have the HSD chronographic image, uh, and you, then you have the, what, what we think we'll, Miri will see with, with, with um, the system. Uh, so yeah, I believe this is on the guaranteed time observations. I, I have to check, but I, definitely people will be, uh, if it's not already guaranteed on guaranteed time, people are gonna propose a way. Uh, on the system. Uh, and um, with MIRI, with the chron chronograph capabilities, we should be able to really resolve the sort of arc second, you know, 0.8 arc second scale um, morphology of the dust in the infrared. And this, of course, will be kind of combined in tandem with the Hubble measurements uh, to really look at the, the particle sizes, the, 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 the um, temperature distribution of that. So yeah, certainly, certainly this is a very interesting system. You know, I've sort of been casually following the sort of the, the, the trajectory of the interpretation for this sort of displaced ring, uh, whether or not this is Jupiter planet or, uh, or not. Um, but yeah, I think JWST will really give us um, a new window 
from the thermal infrared as to what is going on with, with the disk. Um, yeah, I think there's definitely going to be a lot of interest in leveraging Miri's capabilities for studying for Mahat. Um, Anyone have any other questions? Yeah, so I'll go ahead and just throw one out if you don't mind. Um, so when do we expect to see or have the first data about an exoplanet atmosphere from JWST, right? Because it launches soon, right? So it's got to be something that everybody's really excited to to get, right? So yeah, yeah, well, that that's you know that's really the the, the million dollar question here. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, assuming the launch goes as planned, um, it will take about a few weeks for it to get parked in L two. <laughs> Um, Lagrangian point, at which point the commissioning and, and sort of the instrument checkout will begin. Mm -hmm. um, there's sort of no definite start date to the beginning of science observations, or at least the cycle one observations. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're looking at the end of summer of 2022. Mm -hmm. I think they're, they're envisioning about six months of commissioning. Gotcha. Of course, during that time, there will be some, they were going to begin interspersing some science programs. Of course, there's the guaranteed time observations and also early science uh, proposals. Mm -hmm. uh, those will probably begin to speed light in the spring. But again, if this is all depends how smoothly the, the insertion and unfurling of JWST goes, you know, how quickly they can get the calibrations that and, and all, all sorts of things like that. So, um, but I think with sometime in 2022, there should be science coming down and, mm -hmm. and papers going out. So, so yeah. Wow. Within a year, we'll be we'll be on on target and getting science data. Wow, it's amazing. <laughs> so I will ask one other question. Um, so, you know, you had mentioned early on about the frequency of planets that we see around stars, right? And so I was just curious, um, so what would cause some stars to have planets while others don't, if we consider, you know, that planets, that the formation of planets is sort of concurrent, right, with the um, formation of stars, right? Or at least that they're tied together, not necessarily concurrent, but yeah. Yeah, no, this is a great question. Yeah, and this is, um, this is something that I think we, we have, we're starting to get a, a handle on answering that. So mm -hmm. certainly for large, Planets, so gas giants, hot Jupiters. There is um, an emerging trend where higher metallicity stars are preferred. Host stars are preferred. Mm -hmm. So, if your star is metal poor, the argument is that there's fewer solids in your protoplanetary disk mm -hmm. um, within the sort of the the core formation, core accretion model of planet formation. You need a solid core of a minimum mass of like ten Earth masses mm -hmm. uh, that has to accrete within the lifetime of the disk, which is very short, a few million years. So if you don't have a lot of solids, you don't have a lot of ices, you don't have a lot of refractory material, the, the, the thought is that you, you just don't have enough um, embryos, large enough embryos forming, and you will only get at most small terrestrial planetesimals, maybe you'll get like a Neptune, but gas giants are strongly disfavored. Um, but of course, there's a lot of different avenues, possible avenues to planet formation. So I think the picture is still a little bit murky, but I think that, that's one of the trends that, that is prevailing. Um, as far as Earth is concerned, um, sort of Earth-like planets, mm -hmm. I believe there is sort of a preference to cooler, sort of, sort of not giant stars, sort of your, your dwarf stars, the F and G types. Those uh, even M dwarfs. So those seem to be the the uh, they kind of have the preponderance uh, yeah. among the host stars for smaller planets. But again, this this these are only beginning to be teased out. And we, you saw the plot of the planet recurrence rate. But of course, if you sort of marginalize that over many many parameters, things get a little bit fuzzy. So I think with host star uh, host star type, I think there seems to be a trend towards dwarf stars for small planets. But um, the picture is not fully established yet. Gotcha. Thank you. We have one question here, Bob. Um, yeah, so with JWST, you're going to be pushing to lower and lower mass planets, being able to measure the spectrum of the atmosphere around those planets. And presumably, one of the things you, you're going to be looking for is the presence of life. Uh, what is the sort of holy grail you know, the sort of uh, Darth Vader moment where he's looking at the hot planet and he's like, the rebels are there. You know, 
uh, that one place you're going to go to, you're going to say, we know life is there. By what's that holy grail that you're looking for? I mean, that, that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's a very difficult question. I think biosignatures are is, is still a very, very um, sort of an uh, immature field. Um, as you probably, if you were aware of the recent phosphine debate with Venus, you know, you know, even in our own solar system, you know, the interpretation of various biosignatures or potential biosignatures is often very ambiguous. Uh, and I'll have to say. Um, this, this might be sort of pouring cold water, uh, so to speak, but uh, um, J2SC is very much slated to start looking at these super Earths, but it's still going to be a very kind of first or second order picture. You know, um, um, uh, even with the size of J2ST, you know, these signals that you're looking at for super Earths or habitable zone planets, they're very, very small. We're looking at contrast of 10 parts per million or less. So I think, what J2SC actually will be is sort of laying out the kind of exploring that region, the general region of parameter space, these sort of low mass dense planets uh, and in preparation for even more advanced instruments in the future. And we're looking at the next two decades. Um, um, so, you know, we will probably be able to measure major molecular constituents like water, methane, CO, ozone, um, big atmospheric uh, constituents. Um, many of them, of course, are, are um, signs of life in the case of the Earth. But whether or not we will get the precision to determine whether they are, for example, in disequilibrium, you know, uh, for example, uh, on Earth, uh, oxygen is in disequilibrium. Uh, and that's how we can really, if we were an alien civilization looking Earth, we would, with an infinitely expensive, powerful instrument, if we can measure the oxygen abundance on Earth, I think you could snap a finger and say there's life because the, the abundance of oxygen in Earth's atmosphere is many, many times higher than what it would be without biotic processes. Out of, it's basically kept out of equilibrium by uh, plants, in this case, uh, and the ocean. So um, I don't think J2ST will have that level of detail to you know, have a smoking gun. Um, but I think we will start looking at, uh, for example, the TRAPPIST system, TRAPPIST-1E is a uh, super earth in the habitable zone. Um, that's an extremely, that's a very, very amenable plan, uh, system for, for study because the host star is pretty bright. Um, the detail that J2SD will bring will certainly allow us to measure the molecular abundances of, you know, carbon dioxide and oxygen. Um, but yeah, I think that's probably the level, the, the maximum level that we are sort of envisioning for, for these terrestrial planets with J2ST. Um, but I think the insights we gain from looking at these small planets, um, both super Earth and sub-Neptunes, the insights we gain will then help us re-strategize uh, what we are going to pursue in the future for have, truly looking at habitable zone planets. And that requires even bigger glass, even more powerful instruments. Uh, and that's something that people are talking about for, you know, we're talking about the decade of 2040, the 2040 decade. Um, it's, it's still quite out there, um, but I think, you know, I think JWST in that respect is a stepping stone towards looking for habitable planets or you no know, signs of life. I think he has one more question. Yeah, so as we discovered exoplanets, uh, the first ones we discovered were the hot Jupiters, and we, that's all we saw, mostly because that's what we were sensitive to. As we started Kepler, we started seeing lower mass planets, and we started to get sort of a different picture of what solar systems look like around stars, but yet they still didn't really seem to look like our own solar system is do we think that our solar system is still kind of unique or do we think it's a typical solar system or and how does this biasing that we're seeing with like Kepler is that picture changing to make our solar system look more like a normal solar system uh, good question um so um the jury is still out uh, on that and, and the reason is um it's mostly to uh, detect biases and the difficulty in detecting truly solar system-like planets. So 
Earth has a one year long orbit. So uh, a transit survey uh, would have to have a baseline of, of a year. So Kepler has, look, uh, Kepler has a roughly four year baseline. But Kepler has discovered some long period planets um, that are um, in the sort of ice giant terrestrial uh, mass range, but they're very few. Um, um, the other reason for that is that the transit geometry works against you. Um, as you're farther away from your host star, the inclination relative to Earth has to be within a very, very narrow range. So you're only, it has to be, you know, maybe a few tenths of a degree away from edge on. So there's that whole three dimensional inclination distribution that you're blind to. So um, I mentioned in one of the slides that the current estimate for the occurrence of Earth-like planets around sun-like stars is roughly a one per star, which is, it seems like a lot, but that comes with massive error bars. So I think, I think the picture is that the solar system is definitely quite unusual, but by no means uh, exceptional. There, uh, there appears to be a lot of Earth-sized planets, and a lot of them are expected to be in the sort of 1 AU range around solar type stars, or like in the case of TRAPPIST-1, you know, if you have an M dwarf, that habitable zone strings in considerably. And uh, if you're talking about those sort of cool host stars, then certainly you have a lot of habitable zone multi-planet systems um, like Venus and Earth. Uh, are in our solar system. So I think I, I, I think initially when hot Jupiters were all you were really finding, yeah, people were definitely thinking that the solar system was an oddity. But I think with Kepler and Tess, I think that that has the edge has been taken off that that characterization. I think we, we really do think that you know solar system like configurations aren't uncommon. Um, but they do also happen to be extremely hard to detect. Which is sort of the, the catch, you know, the catch there. Yeah. I got a question in the back. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. I'm kind of shouting, but obviously in your presentation, there have been tons of new methods that have been developed to discover exoplanets and even study their atmospheres, which is really cool. But um. There isn't a lot of talk or anything that I have witnessed about any rogue exoplanets or ones without stars. Are there any future developments with James Telescope to see if we can find more of those and study those? Yeah, so I think I thought discovering rogue planets, I think those will still rely on sort of serendipitous searches, uh, all size, uh, all size uh, surveys. Um, but um, so the difficulty with rogue planets is that they tend to be very cold. Um, so, so looking at their, and, and of course they don't transit in front of any body. So transmission spectrum is out of the question. So what you're looking at is, is a thermal emission. Uh, and um, to my knowledge, um, I don't know of any rogue planets that are, that are bright enough to have very high signal to noise emission spectra with JWST. Um, but that, of course, can change. Um, but uh, um, to my knowledge, there are no, there's no guaranteed time um, for any of the nearby rogue planets that we know of. So, um, yeah, and there are not that many rogue planets that we know of to begin with. So it, it really is, it, we might be lucky in, in discovering one that has been lurking in the solar neighborhood so for some reason that we haven't found. But barring that, they are just too cold and faint to be really studied in detail. So I think they're they're interesting. The the fact that they exist is interesting, and looking at their size distribution is is something that will be very impactful for the planet demographics and planetary evolution. But I think looking at their atmospheres is is, is a tall is a tall order. So yeah. I think that's all the questions we have in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yep. Sounds good. Well, thank you, Dr. Wong. We really appreciate the time that you spent. Um, it was an amazing talk we, and we really do appreciate it. And thank you to everybody that's been watching on YouTube. Um, we really appreciate it.
Yeah, it's like our speaker. 